Let's talk about it. Talk, talk, talk. Let's go deep. We all have some share. No share with Dr. Dave. So hello and welcome to the Knowledge Share with Dr. Dave podcast. This is Dr. Dave Cornelius, your host. Um, we're going to talk about social justice today with uh, Angela, Angela Marquez. And so when we talk about social justice, what we're talking about is that everyone deserves equal opportunity equal economic, political, and social rights and opportunities. And the, the goal is to make sure that we open doors of access and opportunity for everyone, right? So in, so in short, when we're talking about is social justice means equal rights and equitable opportunities for all. And today we have Angela Marquez, the Outreach Program Manager of the Data Sciences Academy at the University of Arizona. Angela is also a member of the Navajo or Diné tribe, you know, one of the original people of the United States. So welcome, Angela. Thank you. I'm glad to so, be here. <laughs> yeah. So why don't we just kick off and by you t telling us a little about who you are in your own words and how you would describe yourself as a Navajo or Diné descendant. Great. Uh, She'e Angela Marquez Yenishye. Tachit ni nishle, klash bashachin kia ani dashache, tabaha dashanele. So, hello, <laughs> I'm Angela Marcus. Um, I just shared with you my clans. As a Navajo woman, I have four clans given to me from first my mother, then my, my dad's mother, <laughs> then my ma maternal grandfather's mother, and then my paternal grandfather's mother. So um, traditionally in Navajo culture, your clans come from the woman in your family. And um, that's um, also links to the importance of the woman in the family structure and in the culture itself. So anyways, um, I am born for the Tachitni uh, clan, which is, uh, if you translate it, it means red running into the water. And um, that is one of the traditional, uh, or I guess, original clans for the Navajo tribe. And um, it, it's, it's really common to hear. <laughs> um, so anyway, I uh, grew up on the Navajo reservation. And I uh, often go back and I, my grandmother on my mother's side lives in Loop, Arizona, and, and my other grandma lives um, Black Mesa. So uh, it's a quite a long drive, but it's totally worth it for me to go back a lot. Um, and I just wanted to share also that my grandparents um, did a lot of the raising of me, <laughs> as, as is very common on the reservation. Um, and they taught me lots of things. Um, they taught me the importance of my education. They taught me importance of my culture, sense of need for social justice faith and how to care for my community. So um, I would not be the same person if I didn't have them to help me along. So I'm just so grateful for their, uh, their help along with, <laughs> with who I am. Um, so anyway, I, I just love that I am, I'm Navajo. I didn't realize growing up that it was um, such a, a treasured thing. But now that I'm here in Tucson and I've been here for a while, I realize there's not a lot of Navajos outside of the reservation. And so I'm just so glad that I'm able to um, ask my grandparents everything that I need to know. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really glad to be able to share my experience with you. You're so fortunate. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about how does social justice, any type of challenges show up in your experience as a, a Navajo descendant and a woman of color? So I, oh, I thought social justice, the idea of social justice is such a funny um, idea because it's this need to seek out justice only because injustice has been socially acceptable until recently. Um, I just think that that's just such a funny, <laughs> funny thing, um, because I just didn't really ever think about social justice with that name, social justice, um, until I uh, went to college. Um, so the Diné people have an oral tradition of passing down knowledge from one generation to the next. And so a lot of what I know about my culture and my, my family, um, I, I know by asking the people that I know. Um, but uh, there is not a lot 
past that. Like if I want to know about my great, 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 great grandma, you know, that's not something that um, a lot of people can tell me about. So um, what I can look up in the books is often not something that I want to know necessarily. <laughs> I learn about my people's um, being forced from their land, uh, resources being taken with a promise of some sort of rehabilitation afterwards. And of course that never comes up. Um, I learn about lots and lots of broken treaties throughout history. Um, my grandpa on my, my dad's side is, uh, or I guess he was, he just retired as the um, chief justice of the Navajo Nation. And so he has taught me so much <laughs> about uh, how our government is intentionally different from the U.S. government, um, and that it looks to uh, lead as a as a group of people rather than as a one leader for the nation. So, anyway, um, there's just lots and lots of history for the Navajo people that I I just am so sad to to learn about. Um, you know, we've been taken advantage of, we've been lied to, we've been killed, and those of us that are left behind are, are asked to live in a completely different world with, with things that we don't know how to do. Um, so there's a lot of trauma that, that uh, I inherit, I guess, um, and we as a people are still healing from all of that. And so the Navajo women, like I said before, are seen as very important people of the family. We're seen as leaders and your own identity is given to you by your mother and the, all of the women in your family. Um, so that is uh, very important to me, <laughs> right, as a Navajo woman to be seen as this strong, capable person, um, because that is absolutely my role these days um, in terms of social justice as, as a larger scope. So we build each other up. The women in, in the culture build each other up, and that's exactly what we're doing now. Um, so as a woman of color, as a Navajo descendant, uh, my role is a fighter for social justice. And I have to do that through education. I am a math teacher uh, when I'm not home. When I'm not working at the U of A, I um, am in the classroom and I teach high school math. And I also am an avid gardener, newly. <laughs> um, so anyway, and I am a mother, right? And so all of these avenues I can use uh, as my own um, experience and as my own teaching uh, brings me to fight for social justice and to show that, you know, there, there can be change uh, brought up with, with whatever talents that I can bring to the table, whatever kind of energy that I can bring, um, that it is my absolute duty to, to do that. <laughs> I agree. So when, when, when you're involved in different conversation with people and they talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, um, but how do you feel sometimes? Do you feel like you're treated as a victim uh, or that you should have all the answers? You know, what, what is that experience like? Yeah, so um, I don't know if I would use the word victim. Um, whenever I'm asked about diversity or equity or inclusion or belonging, um, you know, of course, it depends on who's asking the question, right? If it's somebody that I'm familiar with, and I can be open about my experience without too much holding back. Uh, but if it's somebody that I don't really know, um, then I have to be very careful to steer away from the victim kind of dialogue, because that's not who I am, right? Um, I refuse to see myself as somebody that um, is beaten down and stays down. Right. And so I try to steer the, the conversation whenever I can towards um, towards action. What are we doing uh, to help build each other up and help, you know, diversify our, our community? How, how do we bring about equity? Um, all of these things. So, um, yeah, I <laughs> I if I do feel the victim kind of uh, talking coming along, then I, um, I I just try not to to encourage that, I think. OK. So let's talk about your career, right? You know, what has been the impact of social injustice on your career? So um, I, my career has changed. Um, so I graduated from the U of A with a bachelor's in uh, biochemistry and molecular biophysics. And I quickly learned that if I wanted to use that degree that I had to move. <laughs> 
there's not a lot of opportunity for me here in Tucson. And the family that I was building was here. And so I really needed to find something else that I could put my energy towards um, in Tucson. And so I, uh, at that point, I was talking to my mentor that I've had for a very long time, uh, Vicky Curtis, and she uh, basically showed me that I should take my volunteering seriously. So prior to uh, applying to the College of Education, I actually volunteered in the classroom as a tutor and as a teacher for 10 years. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it was kind of funny. I um, just kind of was a teacher and didn't realize it, nor was I getting paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's not much different now, right? <laughs> so, yeah. um, so anyway, I I just thought like, wow, of course, I should totally get into education and specifically math education. Um, so I have found through my work in the classroom that math is a real equalizer of us all. Um, there is no color. <laughs> there is no prejudice when it comes to numbers, right? Um, and so I knew that if I were uh, to bring my own uh, experience and my energy to education, that I would uh, fight for those that are underprivileged, right? Um, because they are not only dealing with these academic problems, but they bring all this other thing from their life experiences that I can directly speak to, right? Um, because I also come from a hard background. Um, so I really see myself as um, a fighter for education in general. Um, so I have been in the classroom for so long and I just cannot get away from math. Uh, when I was studying biochemistry every semester, I would take a math class just because I thought it was so much fun. And um, at the end of it, I am very close to getting a math degree just out of fun. Um, and so <laughs> I just I just love numbers. I don't know what it is about numbers. I just really enjoy studying and learning. And I just love that I don't know so much. You know, there's so much to learn when it comes to math. Um, and you can literally reach the stars if you if you study math, like with a little bit of rigor and discipline, you can go to space. <laughs> so cool. Yeah. <laughs> so um, where I come from, um, Brown kids, Navajo kids, there isn't a common um, goal of college on the reservation, um, which I find to be wrong, but I completely understand because um, there's all of this West weighing us down um, for us to be able to even dream of that. Um, my grandpa, uh, the same grandpa that I mentioned, Herb Yazi, um, he actually told me a story when he was going to school as a young boy. He went to boarding school, um, which I also went to boarding school. That's a lot of our story. Um, but back then, boarding school looked a lot different. And um, you were you were pushed, you were trying to push yourself off of your own culture. I'm not, try, <laughs> I'm not sure how to say that. But um, if you spoke Navajo, you were punished. If you had long hair as a man, you were punished. If you, um, you know, did anything related to being Navajo in this school setting, it was not allowed. And, and so my grandpa, he told me that he, when he first went to school, that he left, <laughs> he ran away and he walked for miles and miles through the desert to get back home. And once he got back home, his parents drove him back. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so it's, it's um, a long history of my family valuing education, even though we were being abused at these schools, that the only way to be able to survive in this world is through education. And so um, that is such a hard story for me to share because like, it's, it's so sad for you to think about these children that have gone through so much for the sake of learning. Um, but nowadays, you know, it's a little different, but still like that's, that's part of a, who we are. That's part of our history. And we have to kind of accept that and, and learn about it um, and grieve that. And then we can, you know, pursue our own education. So that's something that I've had to do. And I know that a lot of my students come to us with these similar kind of baggage, maybe not exactly the same thing, but um, they really they have to overcome a lot of trauma. And so my, my, my role as an educator, right, is to uh, first get to know the, the student, get to know them on a personal level. And then, you know, at that point, then they can learn, right? Um, and so that's a lot of what I did in the classroom was, was listening. Um, so 
I am a strong believer that no matter where you come from, what experiences that you hold on to, um, that we can change our own lives for good. Uh, for me, that's encouraging a strong math education because that is oftentimes the limit, the limiting factor in your own career ideas for yourself. Um, if you don't do well in math, then you very, very much limit yourself for what you can do in the future. So I, as, as, a, as a math educator, want that to not be a hurdle for my students. Understood. That is really inspirational, right? <laughs> to encourage more you know, people of color and to really participate in, in STEM education. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about you personally and, and the things that you're doing um, to improve opportunities for Black, Indigenous, and people of color in your community. So I really like that question. Um, it, it inspires action, it, it requires action, and I just don't ever see that. Um, uh, I, I hear a lot of people talk about their ideals and I hear you know, what I wish, you know, that kind of talking, but there's not a lot of action. So I just really love this question. Um, so I am, as you said before, I'm working at the University of Arizona, the Data Sciences Academy, and that's a new thing at the U of A. Um, and I am help building up uh, support for the data sciences. So that's statistics and data science is going to be a new major. Um, so systems engineering is another one, management information, you know, all of these um, majors that involve some sort of data work. Um, and it is a statistic that is a little bit old by now, but um, there's a statistic out there that 90% of the world's data was collected in the last two years. Um, and so that's huge, right? And that's what we, uh, is referred to as big data, right? Uh, where you have these just millions of data sets and um, all of them each with their own individual data points and not a lot of people know how to manage that. Um, and so our role, our goal anyway, um, in the Data Sciences Academy is to help build up curriculum for K-14 education around data science. Um, and there's absolutely no reason why the BIPOC community cannot be at the forefront of this. You know, our experiences, our collective uh, struggles really make us very adaptable and well prepared for this really big challenge, I believe. Um, and so as a part of the design committee of this, um, this Data Sciences Academy, I can help bring, um, I can help bring this curriculum to communities that the other people in our team wouldn't uh, think of, I guess you could say. And so anyway, I, I just am really excited about this revolution in math education. It's starting in California um, and it's, it's spreading. It's going to get here. <laughs> Awesome. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, I just I'm really excited about that. Um, and that's something that, um, you know, teachers always, always, always need so much support. And if I can offer just a little bit of that, even just a community of we're trying to learn this together. Um, that's what we're doing uh, with the educators and data science. So if you're an educator, and you want to learn more dataacademy.arizona.edu is our website. And um, it's, it's, it's great. We have a yearly um, fellowship where we award teachers for being a part of it. So definitely something to look into. Um, so otherwise, uh, as a, an, a math educator, I, I, of course, I, I build up curriculum, but then also I am an informed voter. <laughs> That's also something that I believe is very important, um, both locally and nationally. Um, and if you're going to help with positive change, um, it, it's small steps, right? It's small steps in, in policy change in government. Um, so that's, I think, one of the, truly one of the only ways that you can affect lasting change um, is by getting involved and not staying quiet. Um, our goal, right, should be to be seen and to be valued, right? We are not going to be treated any less just because we're different, right? Um, and Nobody else is going to fight for that except for you and your own community. So it's, I think everybody's goal should be anyway, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. to be involved in government um, and to never grow weary of doing what is right is kind of one of my mottos that I just have to hold on to. Um, so higher education ed institutions are historically underrepresented and uh, with our efforts for inclusion, we can change that and we can change that starting with funding. So. 
I love it. I love it. I love the insights. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, if we wanted to make significant change in the way we have relationship and integration between BIPOC and non-BIPOC individuals in our community, um, what would be a few things that you would suggest or recommend? Significant change. That is such a great idea. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. <laughs> Just think about that. That'd be great. <laughs> um so I see a lot of that um, happening uh, with the U of A, which I'm so glad. I just love the U of A. I've come here for my undergrad, my master's, and now I'm working here, right? Um, and so I just, I just love this community. Um, and uh, specifically, the Stout Sciences Academy, as you all know, <laughs> is is doing what we can to to help out um, all communities, but the spe specifically the BIPOC communities and the underrepresented communities. Um, so I would absolutely love to see education valued, fully funded, and accessible for all. Um, oh my goodness, that would just be a dream. <laughs> um, <laughs> listening to Bernie Sanders talk about free education. Oh man, <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that would have been so great. <laughs> um, so I think that if we can think of this idea of free education as not being this like far off dream this lofty idea if we can if we can see that the reason why it is such a an, a lofty idea is because that we're being kept down we're being repressed in this very moment um that we can do something about that um we don't have to be desperate for any job because we couldn't get ourselves an education right so i i think that uh if we're free to learn uh we can have we can go through life without having this huge burden of how will I pay for this, right? Um, that shouldn't ever be anybody's excuse for not getting an education. So working together as a whole community, we can address our needs and we can grow together. And the way that we can do that is if we see ourselves with dignity and deserving of a spot at the big table. Um, and you can do that through education, <laughs> through learning, you I can empower yourself, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I strongly agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. <laughs> so, you know, I always like to ask people this question about utopia. Uh, you know, if you had like a diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging utopia, and you could make that whatever you wanted it to be, what would it look like for you? Oh. <laughs> Get a uh, dream a little. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I just think that if we are free to learn, we are free to be right. Um, free, accessible education for all is what I, I look for in a utopia. Um, but, you know, with that comes all of these ideas that, um, you know, free or not free, but like affordable housing is part of that. Right. If you are an educated person, you learn that there are so many things that you can do to help build yourself up and and strive towards this utopia. Um, housing is one of them. Education is one of them. I mean, like on the Navajo reservation, it sounds funny for me to share this, but water, <laughs> water is not accessible on the reservation. Um, the, I, I forget what the exact statistic is, but um, for my own experience anyway, we have to haul water because we don't have any running water in our house out there. Um, and that takes about, uh, I think about an hour and a half to get some water. <laughs> and that's just completely bonkers to think it, um, if I didn't have this experience, it would just be so, so foreign to, to just see that. Like, um, so anyway, <laughs> water is part of that. I mean, electricity alongside that, um, man, <laughs> once you become uh, educated, once you reach out towards all of these ideas of inclusion, you see like there's so much that we can do to build each other up. Um, but I strongly believe that it starts with education because that is all of the careers, right? That's science, that's technology, that's engineering, math, art, whatever, you know, um, we can create a better tomorrow if we are informed people. <laughs> Without a doubt. You know, um, Angela, thank you so much for sharing your insights, um, your experiences. I don't want to screw up. Is it Ayazi? Is how you say it? How would you say yeah, that's my maiden name. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. what I wanted to know. Ayazi, you know? Uh -huh. Yeah, Angela yeah. Yazi. It's so funny. When I share my clan, I, I very often say my name is Angela Yazi because that's just like 
in my brain to say that with my plan. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, if you were to say Angela Yazi, then everybody would know that I'm Navajo, I think. So it's yeah, a very yeah. common Navajo name. <laughs> <laughs> is it? It really is, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, I just wanted to, to point that out because I, I thought it was so cool. You know, the way you have it in parentheses when I when you get an email from you. <laughs> <laughs> it's the U of A. I went here as a student and my net ID is a Yazi and they just yeah. gave me the same one. So I had okay. to call, I called my mom and I was like, I'm back to a Yazi. <laughs> like, welcome I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Angela Yazi. That's beautiful. So I'm gonna close because unless you have any final things that you want to share with our audience about the amazing Angela Yazi Marquez? <laughs> um, I don't think so. Just one more shout out to our, our data science dot Arizona. I'm sorry, data academy dot Arizona dot edu is, is where you can find information. Uh, if you're an educator, uh, that just doesn't just mean teachers, right? It can be um, tutors, it can be teaching assistants, it can be admin. Um, if you are in education, you consider yourself an educator, uh, definitely look us up. Uh, we are not a burden, we try to help. So um, yeah, if, you, if you're there, then we wanna help you. <laughs> Good, so I'll, I'll point this out and share it with a few people. Um, so I just wanna close and say, thank you for listening to the Now Share with Dr. Dave podcast. You know, I hope this learning experience would also prompt you to take and seek more and discover how we could contribute to a positive experience for BIPOC lives. Um, it really doesn't take much for us to just tap into our own humanity to share what we have. You know, it doesn't take much. Um, I would like to say that the music for this podcast was written by my niece, Kiana Brow Hendrickson, so I'm giving her a shout out. Um, this podcast is copyright 2021, nalshare.org and Dr. Dave Cornelius. And I'd like to say until next time, be well, stay safe, and connect soon. And Angela Yazi Marquez, again, just thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Let's talk about it. Talk, talk, talk. Let's go deep. We all have something to share. No, no share with Dr. Dave.